Welcome to After Hours Engineering, Episode 8. In the previous episode, we covered the reset sequence as HDL and as a data flow, and we implemented our first instruction, the eBreak. Now that we have our control matrix coded, we need to bind it with the other components to build our soft core processor, the Ranger Risk, which means we need to create a new module. To help us, we have our data flow diagram and you may notice that there are blue labels all over it. Those are the connection lines between the modules. They will help guide us in connecting the components together. So let's start building, shall we? Here is the module for our soft core processor, the Ranger Risk. And as like all modules, we have a header that has parameters and we have two inputs. And we'll also have some outputs when we start dealing with uh, external devices. But for now, we just have the clock and the reset signal. We also have that very important reset vector constant. And in this case, it's always given in byte address format. So whatever word address you're using, you multiply it by four to get the byte address equivalent. After that is all the wires and buses that define and connect all the paths between the components. Some are a single wire and some are a bus. You can see that we have a lot of signals connecting and all of these should look relatively familiar based on the data flow diagram with all the blue letters um, sitting up against all the wires. That's what all of these values are. We have com anything that starts with a CM underscore is a wire that goes from the control matrix out to some other component. And in this case, this, this particular one is going out to the MUX that is next to the PMMU. We have a bunch of wires, the uh, ALU, the flag loading, the RSAs, the MDR value or register. Um, and there's quite a few here, but these are where they're all defined right up top. And then last, we have all the modules that we built up. And the very first, of course, is the most important, the control matrix. This is the one that takes a couple of inputs, a few inputs, and emits a whole series of outputs. And each one of these outputs, you'll notice, will route to one of the other modules down below. As an example, we have the MMU. It takes a clock input, a reset, um, a byte, address formatted address and then a bunch of other signals that we control and you'll notice there's two signals coming from the control matrix feeding into the MMU and we'll notice this style on all of the components so if we go to the next one here is the PC mux that is taking the four different values that source into the program counter and routing them in based on the signal coming from the control matrix and here's that reset vector that's being fed in on the diagram. We can also see that with the uh, address mux takes two, and again, it's being driven by a control matrix signal. The reset mux down by the PMMU, the program counter, that's very important. We have our clock in there to load in and the load signal, and then the output or the input, and then the output. Now it says out here, but that means it's a wire going from its predecessor, which is the MUX, over to the PC register itself. So this out means out from the MUX itself. So we have the PC prior register, the instruction register, that one's important as well. Then we have the ALU, and again it has its two source operands, the function the ALU is going to do, again that's being coming from the control matrix, and then the results of that output and any of the flags which will be used for branching eventually. And we have our output register here, the ALU out, that will be used later on and we haven't covered it yet in full. Then we have the uh, flags register that captures the flags coming out of the ALU. And then we have the two muxes that are driving the ALU. You can feed in the program counter, the prior value of the program counter, a literal zero and then one of the, the source registers out of the register file, the RS1, which I'm calling RSA in this case. And the BMUX is the same way, only this time we have a constant four being fed in and the option of another zero if B needed to be zero, which it will never be in the RISC-V processor, in our design at least. And we have the MDR, which captures values out of the MMU for other types of cycles. 
Then we have the immediate extend, and again, all it takes is the instruction register, and out pops a formatted or concatenated value, or sometimes unswizzled values into three on the B mox here. Yeah, right here. So you can see these two values are highlighted. They're feeding into each other. So then we have our register file. It takes a, a clock, as of course, and it's driven by the control matrix. We have our data going in, and we have our two sources, and there's two sources out, and then the destination register that we're going to write to. And we have the RSA. These are just always loading. They help split up and make it a multi-cycle so we can hold the data longer. And then finally we have the WDMOX, which is part of the write back feature. We can either take the immediate value or the latched version into a register, MDR, straight out of the MMU. And there you have it. That's all the components. They're all wired up. Each one of those lines that we have defined up top here or the wires that go between the components. And that's it. That's the entire Ranger RISC processor in about 300 lines of code, of HDL code. That finishes the processor module. Now we need to code for the processor to run. And that we'll find in our section of machine code, which we're going to look at the eBrake first. And that's in the iType, because the eBrake is an iType instruction. We know looking at the manual, volume one manual, the format of the instruction itself is built out of this. Function 12, RS1, function 3, RD, and opcode. I have manually gone ahead and broken out the fields as they are, then I've redistributed them in nibbles and then put them together in hex, which then I put at the word address of one. That's where I want our new instruction to start which in byte address is 4. And then I throw over here the mnemonic for the e-brake. Also, our reset vector. Remember back in the uh, Ranger RISC module at the top, we had a reset vector defined as 10 times 4. But 10 is the word address. So if we come back to here, here's our word address. And here is the number 4. So word address 1 is actually byte address 4. So this is the code we want to run in the processor. So let's copy this section right here, actually the entire section right here, into a file that we'll call RAM files. So if we open up the RAM folder for the RAM file and come down to eBreak, you can see that I have copied in the files and expanded out the values between A and F and 1, 0. And there's our reset vector, and there is our instruction. So we should see that when our processor runs, it'll execute this single instruction and halt immediately. Now we need to take this RAM contents and make sure that it gets loaded into the BRAM. Remember, in order to do that, we go to our memory module, and we modify a few fields uh, macro defines here. We have our RAMs, which is where our RAM file is located under the RAMs directory, and then our subtype is the iType. So we'll set iType there, and then the name of the file is eBreak. That will match up with our readmem function that will concatenate all three of those components together and load that into memory. Now that we have memory configured to load, we'll come over here to the make file and check it out. This has been modified to handle the entire RISC processor. Up top, we have the definition of the, the name of the module that we'll be using. So if we come back over to our module, we know it's called Ranger RISC. We also have our test bench with our CPP files. We'll cover that in a minute. And then we have our GTK Wave, which uses specific filter setup on it. And we'll cover that as well. And then finally, we have all the modules that we've covered in this entire series listed right here in the order in which they depend on each other. For example, I wouldn't put one of these modules up here above definitions or type enums, otherwise Verilator cannot see what's in these files. You need to include your header, your source code, in the order of the dependencies that they are. For example, most if not all of these modules depend on the definitions and the type enums. And of course we have our very top module, the softcore processor itself, which is the Ranger RIC that we have defined up here.
The rest of this is pretty much familiar. It's standard make files that we've covered. We have our linting set up. We have the compile mechanism where we've defined all of our um, flags that we want to use to turn on things. We want to use the ROM configuration. We can also run it and view it and type go. We'll most likely be doing make space go to run this. As we saw in the make file, we have our test bench code. And here is the topmost code, the test bench itself. And you can see we've covered this before, but we'll do a real quick overview of it. We have some conversion functions that we have inside the miscellaneous file. It's a stepping function, abort, a loop function, and a reset, plus a local function for dumping memory if we need to look at it. Like all verilators, it starts with a main. We initialize the command arguments. We're going to use that special um, template that we created that helps deal with our modules a little bit better. And then we can go into it and ask for the core, which is the actual RISC CPU itself. We can ask it for internal components, the root, which is the top. And we can ask for the memory management unit and then the VRAM within the memory management unit. We set up our time, st time step. And then we start off with the very first call that we make to our test bench, the eval. We need this in order to run any initialized blocks up front. Without this, the processor, the simulation doesn't start quite right. You really need to run at least one evaluation step first. Then we dump some memory, and then we run through the reset sequence to make sure that that runs. And then we begin the actual looping of the processor itself. And then when we're done, we dump out memory and we finish and shut down. That's the test bench and it's built up of other miscellaneous files. Here's that stepping function and the abort. And then we have the reset sequence that we've seen before. We have a while loop that runs through and just burns out the clock in the reset. And then finally we have the looping code which is nothing more than a very tight eval and time step. So that's all of the test bench that we're going to use inside of our make file. And finally we'll look at the filter features of GTK Wave. In this particular case I have a filters folder that has a bunch of filters all set up in it. And what the filters are is a flat file of sorts that you have a value to the left and some text to the right. And when that particular signal presents that value then the GTK Wave will replace it with a word. And these are very handy for um, looking at the waves without having to calculate what the value actually means in your head. And we have it for pretty much everything in the processor. The instruction states, which you've seen a whole bunch of, uh, immediate values, the I, the S, B, J, and U, anything that's unused, our B sources, whether we're adding 4 or our A source, we're adding PC or PC prior. Each one of these filter files will set up a text value associated with a actual signal value. And so in the last part of this episode we'll run the simulation and I've already typed make go and we're looking at the output. In this episode we're just going to cover a very brief high level view of the timing diagram. In the next episode we'll look at it in much greater depth relative to the data flow diagram and the HDL. So we'll start off by knowing that our processor is going to go through a reset sequence as long as this reset signal here is held low. And then when it's raised, it will then begin finishing off the rest of the reset sequence. So let's take a look at it. We know that we should start off in the reset, and we are. And we continue on down here until the reset signal goes high. We then begin to transition from vector 0 to vector 1, and then from vector 1 to vector 3, and then finally the next state will be the fetch state, which is what we see up here, because the next state is showing right here, and then it finally appears right here. Then the decode, then the decode actually happens, the next state is execute, and then we execute. And this is going according to our control matrix, excellent. And we're also marching through each one of our vector states, as soon as the reset goes high here, we then finish out the vector 0, vector 1, vector 2, and then vector 3, and we stay in vector 3 for the rest of the running of the processor. So that's good. We also know that we are on 
what appears to be a load instruction. And then even though that is true, again, we're in the reset sequence, so there really isn't any instruction for this to, to appear. This is showing up because the default value for the IR state is the IT load value. It won't change until we've actually really loaded an instruction during the actual running of the processor, which happens here at the fetch, decode, and execute. And you can see that we're executing the break instruction that we had loaded into memory. And that's when the instruction state changes. So that's going all according to plan. So we can see here that our instruction opcode, which is a type E, is running all the way along here until we hit an actual I type E. And that's as, as we expect, because when we go and fetch, the first thing we're going to do is figure out what type of instruction it is. And we can see that it's an I type. And then we decode it and execute it, which again, we hit the break here. We can also see the instruction itself. Remember, in our code, we saw 010073. That's the E break code for this. Excellent. We know that we're also loading in the program counter at least twice. Once here in this vector state, vector 0, and another time in vector 2. That's exactly what we expect. Remember, this one is loading in the reset vector itself, and then this one is loading the address of the first instruction so that then we can then begin the actual running of the CPU. Now, by the way, the ready flag indicates when the CPU is running. So it's not running right here because we're in the reset sequence. As soon as the reset is finished, the ready goes high, and we begin executing our first instruction until we hit the E break, which it then goes low and we've stopped. So that's going according to plan. We can also see that we were loading in that reset vector constant on the output of the PC mux, on the input of the PC mux, which was 40. That's the location of the reset vector address. We can also see that the we're loading in the address of the first instruction, which is at 004. That's also what we expect. And of course, that happens just before we get into the running of the instruction itself. Excellent. And we've also, if we look at the program counter itself, we can watch that it increments from 0 to 4. And that's what we're seeing right here, PC out, 0, 4, 4, and then we auto increment to 8. Excellent. The program counter is also incrementing. That's great. And we have the ALU. We can see that the ALU, the PC source, is set to reset vector. That's what we expect inside of the reset sequence. Then it transitions to ALU immediate, and then it transitions. This is just an intermediate value. This is the default value where we're trying to prevent latches. And then we hit a real value where we hit go grab that reset address, which is right there, that 004. Excellent. That's going according to plan. And then we can see that we're reading from memory twice. We're reading the reset vac uh, address right here, the first instruction. And we're also reading the first instruction right here. This is the address of the first instruction. And this is the actual instruction itself. Excellent. And then there's no more writing. We're not doing anything else. And then you can ignore the bytes and half words because we're not doing anything down here. Although you can see how we are loading them in. But we'll cover that in a later episode. So there you go. This is an overview of the first time we're running our processor. Excellent. There we have it. A working soft core processor, the Ranger RISC. And we covered quite a few topics. Ranger RISC modules, the coded the e-break instruction, set up memory, configured a make file, reviewed our test bench, touched on GTK wave folders, and finally covered a high level overview of the simulation itself. But we have more to go. So until next time, peace.